That's Loretta Lynn. She can still sing. I saw her on the tube the other day. White Christmas. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of AM Minnesota. We have John Fossum in studio today. He is Rice County's attorney. I was just thinking, John, that I don't have a, a picture of you for to put on our website. I'll have to get your picture taken here before you leave today. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll fix that then. So we can, you know, people can visualize you on the radio. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can watch YouTube, I guess. Well, I do have a face made for radio, so that's fine. No, I, I wouldn't <laughs> go that far. I do, but I wouldn't go that far with yourself. So how have the holidays been for you? Well, well it's been great. We had, a, we had a nice holiday weekend last weekend, and... and Nice dinner. I, I was out for the uh, uh, TZD DWI kickoff on Wednesday night here at the Fairville Police Department. Did a ride along with uh, uh, one of the sheriff's deputies for a couple of hours and then uh, went home and on Thursday morning got up and, and volunteered for the turkey trot in Northfield. Uh, I've been uh, guarding one of the corners there for most of the uh, 18 or so years that they've been doing that. Um, so that's always a, a fun day for me. And uh, dinner with the family got to, and we went and watched uh, the uh, that new Harry Potter movie, the the uh, Dangerous Beasts movie on uh, on Saturday. I'll be darned. You didn't watch the Viking game on Thanksgiving. I did watch part of that as well. It ended like a lot of Vikings games that I've seen. <laughs> yeah, they blame the <laughs> offense, but the defense gives up touchdowns late. Yeah, scores late. Anyway, we're not here to talk about the Vikings. We're going to talk a little bit about holiday scams and some other topics I know I guess I wanted to bring up the holiday thing because I was telling you before we hit the airwaves I was out of bashers having lunch earlier this week and a gentleman sitting next to me at the bar said my bank account recently got hacked I said really he said yeah it's happened twice in the last week Wow so he wanted to make sure that that I check my bank statements right well you got to be careful with your debit cards you got to be careful with uh, your passwords. Make sure that you're not sharing them. Be careful with emails that you get. Somebody sends you an email and there's an attachment to it. And you don't know who's sending it to you. Don't open that. Um, and uh, you know, if somebody's offering you something by email, like offering to send you a bunch of money for for something you didn't do, um, you know, that's you don't want to get involved in that. Most likely, that's going to be a ripoff. Which brought me to the idea that you probably are seeing an increase in cybercrime here locally, because I know you are nationwide. Yeah, and you know, part of the issue for us is it's difficult for us to, to find the person to prosecute when it's uh, a cybercrime, uh, because you know they could be in Latvia for all we know. Yep. And uh, but you know, one of the things too at this time of year, we need to be careful of, of thefts and, and packages, and if you're having packages delivered. Try and have them delivered to some place where somebody is. Uh, you know, if you can deliver them to your office, maybe the neighbors, or the neighbors, or someone who will safeguard it. Someone who's at home to accept the package for you, uh, so that it's not sitting out on the porch making an easy grab for somebody. Uh, that's always best to just be safe and, and help avoid losing those things. But if something does happen, what is the step? What's the should I call your office? Should I call the police? Call the police. Uh, the police will investigate, and uh, if we can, if they can figure out who did it and who's got it, then we can, then they'll refer it to us for prosecution or refer it to the city attorney's office, depending on what kind of, uh, uh, you know, what kind of value we're talking about. If you had insurance on it, you know, contact the people who insured the package. Uh, sometimes the uh, the delivery company has insurance. Sometimes your credit card has insurance. Uh, so check with those places too to see if you can get your money back through them. Uh, but be sure to call the police and file a report so that there's a, a record that, that something happened. It's probably not a bad idea to get that insurance. Then. And it's not a bad idea to get the insurance either. I mean, that that could certainly uh, save your holidays. Yeah. I know when I go on my international trips, I tend not to buy the insurance. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a bright move or not, but... and. Uh, you know, since I'm not here to sell the insurance, I guess no. I don't. <laughs> I, I don't take much. It's, it's kind of a personal choice, but yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, there's times where that that pays off, and times where uh, you've spent a little bit of money. So I guess you have to decide, depending on what it costs, whether it's worth it to you or not. Yeah, we're going to talk about some other topics when AM Minnesota can. An hour. Well,
Thanks for that opening market report. A service of your KDHL Agri Boosters. They include Hanson Seed, your Gold Country Seed dealer by Nearstrand. Talk with Randy or Jeremy about Gold Country Seed harvest results and early season discounts. Ag Power Enterprises, your John Deere dealer in Owatonna, Hollandale. Bell Plain, also Osage and Northwood, Iowa. John Fossum's Rice County is attorney. He is with me today on AM Minnesota. Tonight, by the way, we have Carlton Knight men's basketball. It's a conference opener at St. Mary's in Winona, so I get to drive to Winona this evening. Doesn't that sound like fun, John? Well, it's it's only snowing a little bit, so it should be a really nice drive for you. Yeah, they're talking a little mix of precipitation. Well, that's the way it goes. That's, that's why you get the big money. Going. Yeah, yeah. And Carlton just has come back from Hawaii. They're out in Hawaii over the Thanksgiving weekend. They split games with a couple of Division Two teams in Hawaii at a tournament there. Why didn't you go to those games? Well, I've been lobbying for that for years. Yeah. They go every other year. But they said, you can you can come, Gordy, if you want to pay for your, you know, airfare and hotel. Well, That's the it, way it goes. I, Winona's almost as good. That's exactly what I said this morning on Power 96. You must have heard that. No, I missed that. But I said, no. you know, it's not Hawaii, but it's very close. It's very close. Winona. It's, <laughs> it's it's south, so it's it'll be warmer and sunnier. Yeah, well, we hope so. Anyway, that's tonight. We'll get underway at 6:45 to 7 o'clock. Tip-off MIC conference opener for the Carlton men. As I mentioned, in the next couple of days, I'm hoping to have someone in representing the Faribault Hospice Foundation. They've changed some things since Alina took over District One Hospital. So the hospice, the local hospice fundraiser, the Light Up a Life Tree Lighting Ceremony, which will be broadcasting live here on KDHL Monday night is actually part of the foundation, not part of the line of hospice. They're totally separate. So we're trying to get someone in studio to explain all this on AM Minnesota in the next couple of days. But we appreciate your coming in, John, and enlightening us about things going on. Yeah, well, I appreciate the invitation. I know one of the big stories recently, I guess, has been uh, some dealings with immigration. And, um, you know, it, one of the things that we always deal with in, in our office is uh, that when people are convicted of crimes, there's a lot of consequences tied up in that. And a lot of people want us to uh, do things so that they don't have consequences. They don't lose their firearms. They don't get deported. They don't, uh, you know, they, they don't uh, lose the opportunity to seek a certain kind of employment because of their convictions. And um, sometimes it's appropriate for us to deal with that, and sometimes it's not. And one of the issues, of course, is that um, people who are not citizens, uh, who are convicted of felonies uh, and some misdemeanors, can be deported. And sometimes you get a couple of DWIs. It's, there's a potential you could be deported for that. You get a couple of uh, you get a domestic assault. There's a potential you could be deported for that. And uh, there are some felonies that make people deportable. Uh, crimes of moral turpitude is what the, uh, the immigration law talks about. So crimes of dishonesty, theft, burglary, uh, and violent crimes, crimes which cause harm to other people. Uh, so uh, uh, assault, a lot of assault crimes, a lot of assault felonies make people deportable. And um, you know, one of the issues that comes up is people uh, realize afterwards that there are consequences and they want us to undo their convictions and that's a really difficult thing for us to do uh, partly because once we do it for somebody uh, how do we say you know how do we deal with the next person say well you did it for this guy why can't you do it for me and um, our position is and my position is for my office is that I can't be the one who decides who stays in the country and who goes that's not really appropriate for me and it's not appropriate for me to decide that people from one country shouldn't have to go back, but people from another country have to go back. Those are decisions that have to be made in Washington. Those aren't decisions to be made here in Faribault. Yeah, the Immigration Service deals with that. Right. And so ICE has their rules, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement has their rules about who goes where and when, and uh, they go before an immigration judge who can uh, who has some discretion in some cases, in some cases they don't have discretion, but ultimately um, 
you know, my obligation is to treat uh, people who commit crimes who aren't citizens uh, equivalently as I treat people who commit crimes who are citizens. And I can't justify to the citizens of Rice County that I'm going to treat uh, criminal non-citizens or criminal aliens, as the uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement calls them, differently than I would treat criminal citizens. And it's just uh, that ultimately is where we are in our office. It's just that you know the immigration consequences aren't, aren't things that we're going to weigh into uh, in in the cases that we deal with, and yeah. we're certainly not going to go back and undo people's convictions because it makes them deportable. That was the request right. in this case, in, in, in one of your recent cases. Right. To go back and, and undo one of the convictions. I mean, it was a, a case where somebody had multiple felonies that were resolved as two felonies and a couple of misdemeanors. And so really we couldn't go back and unmake that omelet, right? I mean. We can't go back and, and put the person back in the position they were beforehand, and we can't say that this conduct is less serious than the conviction says it is because it, there were actually more serious charges that were dismissed in order to get to the level that they got to in that case. That's got to be tough in your position to make those decisions, I guess. It is tough, and I'll be honest. It's something I struggled with over uh, several days, and I talked to, I talked to the lawyers on the other side. I talked to uh, lawyers in my office, and I talked to uh, other people who, uh, you know, and and got a bunch of opinions and and uh, thought it through, and ultimately decided that the only way for me to be fair to everyone is to treat everyone equally, and that uh, I can't decide who goes back to what country. Uh, I, and I can't decide based on where they're going to that it's unfair for them to go back. I can't decide uh, that some people shouldn't have to go back, shouldn't have to be deported uh, because they think it's unfair. I have to just kind of try and treat everyone as, as fairly as I can. Well, as you said, if it was a U.S. citizen, you got to treat them exactly the same. Right. To the letter of the law. It, and it wouldn't be fair to a, a citizen in the same situation to say, well, this guy gets a, 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 a misdemeanor conviction where, for you, I would send you to prison and give you a felony conviction. For that's doing the same thing. For doing the same thing. It's not, it, that's not an appropriate reason for me to do that. But I think we've talked about plea deals before, right. plea bargains or deals, however you want to term it. I mean, it's a necessity in your business, otherwise the court system would be... <laughs> burgeoning at the seams as it is anyway. Right. It's uh, one of the judges always used to say we have 10 pounds of stuff in a five pound bag. And uh, so plea deals are important and we we don't always offer deals though. Sometimes we say you've got a plea discharged. Sometimes the uh, the case is important enough and and uh, that we we say this is the only appropriate offense. This is the only appropriate conviction. You have to plead to this or go to trial. And um, sometimes there are reasons not to do that. We, we have to consider the collateral. We do consider the collateral consequences to a certain extent, but we're not going to give up on a case because it has immigration consequences. Uh, we have to consider the victims. You know, How much do we want to re-victimize the person who's been victimized by putting them on the stand and having them cross-examined, by having them sit through uh, a week or two or three or four of trial uh, and watch what happens uh, by having you know years of appeals uh, on a case where if we can resolve it with a plea agreement sometimes that's the appropriate thing to do and sometimes that's the best thing for uh, for justice because now we've got someone who admits their crime and cannot come back and say oh, well, my lawyer did a really poor job and I should have done this, and then we have to go back and try the case all over again. So there's a lot of things that we keep in mind and there's a lot of things to balance. It is a constant balancing act from, from our end and we try to reach a just result, but it doesn't mean that everybody gets a plea deal. Uh, it does mean that most cases are resolved with plea agreements. Sometimes uh, 
my offer to people has been plead as charged. And sometimes they do that because it's a strong enough case. And then maybe, for example, you'll no. go to bat at sentencing or something? We'll, we'll agree on a sentence and say that if we go to trial and win, I'm going to look for uh, I'm going to look for a sentence up here, but if you agree to plead guilty now, I'll give you a sentence down here, right. and I'll agree to that. And you, but you have to agree to the same thing. So it's, um, like I said, it's a constant balancing act, and there's a lot of factors for us to consider. It's not something that, you know, it's the one thing that I know that they can't have a computer replace me to do, because it's not subject to kind of ticking the boxes and figuring things out. That you know, it's it's uh, sometimes it's just this is what I think is the right thing to do, and this is what we're going to go forward with. Same with judges, I suppose. You could never have a computer replace a judge either. Well, and that's one of the that's yeah, that's one of the issues is because, um, and and that's one of the issues that legislatures have had with judges where they impose sentencing guidelines and mandatory minimums and all sorts of things to keep the judges from exercising discretion, from having discretion. But the judges do have some discretion, and sometimes they're stuck in those boxes. And uh, and frankly, this is just my own opinion, but I think a judge should have some discretion. There are some, you know, maybe some circumstances that are unique to each case. Right, and I may not always agree with the the way the judges exercise their discretions, uh, their discretion in cases, and you know we might argue about it, and we'll go in there and and fight for what we think is the appropriate resolution and the other side goes in and fights for what they think is the appropriate resolution and the judge makes a decision and in the end we all you know we all live with what the judge did because that's their role I, I perform my function of, of telling them what I think is the appropriate sentence and the defenses perform their function and then the judge performs theirs I don't remember did I ask you before have you ever been a defense attorney I was a defense attorney for 20 years before I got this job okay so you know, yeah. I mean, you can kind of read what the defense is going to do coming into the. That's got to be a, a nice advantage for you. Well, it, I think that you know, good lawyers, and this is what I always tell my staff, and what I'm always looking for. Uh, you should be able to anticipate what the other side is going to do, and if you don't, if you get blindsided and you get surprised, uh, that's kind of on you. Uh, but I think it is an advantage because I do know what the what. The defense wants to do and how they're going to try and do it. It doesn't mean I always uh, carry the day. Right. Um, sometimes the judge still does something that I didn't want them to do. Um, but we have the cases we have, we have the facts we have, we have the investigations we have, and we we do our best to present them and uh, to uh, achieve a just result. And the bottom line is, people need to pay for their consequences. Well, they make a decision to do something illegal, they should have to pay for that. That's right, and the, a lot of those consequences aren't under my control, and um, I can't, I can't say that you know just because this means that you know something really awful happens to you, doesn't mean that that shouldn't happen. In John Fawson's Rice County Attorney, in this most recent case, correct me if I'm wrong, wrong, but there is a BB gun involved in this and there was some belief that it's not a yeah illegal it's a it's a kind of complex question but a, a couple of months ago the Minnesota Supreme Court overturned a conviction of a felon in possession of a firearm case because the firearm in question was a co2 powered pellet gun and the Supreme Court said that's not a firearm and the issue from our standpoint was that for 40 years we've been relying on an interpretation from a previous Supreme Court case that said that a BB gun is a firearm and now it's not. So uh, that's fine. We deal with the law as we get it. But that was specific to the determination of whether or not At it's a firearm. It uh, well, no, it's, it's about whether or not that's a firearm. And um, the case that we were talking about, this case, uh, this was charged out as a drive-by shooting and a uh, assault with a dangerous weapon. And a BB gun is still a dangerous weapon. It's not a firearm. We agree, you know, I'll agree with that. That's right. not, it's not a firearm. We can't use that argument anymore. And, and that's fine. And this is a conviction that occurred six years ago. And so uh, the, 
other charge, which was uh, a drive-by shooting, is a more serious charge than the felon in possession charge. That would have required a longer prison sentence as a more serious offense, and it also would have required automatic deportation. Instead, there was a plea to this uh, dangerous weapon charge. The uh, it's called second degree assault, and which is before you. Got it was lost. yeah. This yeah. is this all happened six years ago when I wasn't in the office. And actually, the, the lawyers who handled the, the case aren't around okay. anymore either, so yeah. it's not. Um, the people who were uh, available aren't available to talk to us about it. But it, so they reduced that charge to the to the dangerous weapon charge. But a BB gun is still a dangerous weapon. Uh, I've got a case now. We've charged a guy with uh, using a pencil as a dangerous weapon. Um, you know, fists can be a dangerous weapon. Well, no, not really. That's just in the movies. But, uh, you know, an automobile can be a dangerous weapon. We've charged people with second degree assault for trying to run somebody down with a car. Uh, a lot of things can be a dangerous weapon. So a BB gun is absolutely a dangerous weapon. Somebody could, could be seriously hurt with that. And Frankly, I'm not even sure in this case whether it was a, a pellet gun or a BB gun. Either way, it's a dangerous weapon. And this was not some sort of youthful prank. This is a kid who was 30 years old at the time, chasing people around with his BB gun, shooting at him from a car. And he got really a relatively good resolution. Um, and so it's not for me to go back and undo things that happened six years ago. Part of my obligation at my office is to defend the legitimate convictions uh, achieved by the office. So even though it was done by a different office, different set of attorneys, right. you would have agreed with how that was handled. Well, you know, if if there was something wrong with the conviction, you know, I, I would have an obligation to agree to do something to undo an unlawful conviction. But if it's a lawful conviction, I have an obligation as county attorney to defend the convictions even though they were done when my predecessor was in office. And that's part of my my obligation is my obligation to the county and, and I take that seriously and I don't get to undo things whether I agree or disagree with them unless there's some really legitimate reason like a person was you know a person can establish that they were actually innocent of the crime and that they were convicted of but that there are bad consequences that flow isn't one of those reasons yeah again we get back to the you make the decision to fire the dangerous weapon, we better pay the consequences for doing that. Right, and you know, if you're living that lifestyle at that time, um, that there are consequences even years later, um, that's not that's not up to us. I mean, and, and again, in this case, um, there were deportation proceedings commenced, I think, in 2010. Uh, there was an order of deportation in 2012 and here we come in 2016 saying, oh, you need to undo this conviction because now they really mean it. It's like, well, this has been going on for six years. It's, it's too late for us to be involved in this decision. The people to complain to, again, are the people doing the deportation, not, uh, you know, I can't, I can't legitimately agree that that conviction shouldn't be there because then what do I do for everybody else? who feels like their conviction has unfair consequences to them. You'd be a very busy guy. I would be. Because everyone would come back and say, hey. Right. And if it's, you know, if we agree that Cambodia is not a good place to go, what about Guatemala and El Salvador and Sudan and Somalia and all of the other terrible places that people come from and wind up here? Those, those decisions are Again, those decisions are, are to be made uh, in the deportation system, in the immigration system, yeah. and not in the local courts. And I get the feeling that you're kind of glad you don't have to decide whether somebody goes back to Cambodia or Siberia or wherever. Right. I mean, it's not... I just don't feel like that's a decision that I should make. You have plenty on your plate. I got, I got other things. To, I got a lot <laughs> of important other things to deal with. Plenty on your plate. With just a few minutes left of the show, 2016 is coming to an end here soon. Do you know, and I, I don't know if you've looked at statistics recently, have your case, has your caseload been up from last year or uh, the our, same? Our child protection caseload is up pretty significantly. 
Um, and to be honest, Gordy, we, we did a database conversion uh, two weeks ago, so our numbers aren't particularly reliable at the oh, moment. Okay. Um, our felony numbers are pretty even from last year, um, and so the criminal caseload is pretty steady. Uh, the though down from what it was a number of years ago, and the um, but our child protection caseload has been growing pretty significantly over over the time that I've been in office. How about juvenile crime? Because I know that used to really be a sore spot here in yeah. Rice County. And juvenile crime is way down from where it was uh, 20 years ago. That's good news. Um, partly because there's a lot fewer kids than there used to be. Well, that's true. They're they're. Um, and partly because we found other ways of dealing with juvenile crime, but um, uh, as we get as as the lump of kids gets bigger, um, if you look at the population of the schools, eighth grade and below are higher than uh, than the ninth grade and above. I mean, there's more kids in those those lower grades, so I expect we'll probably see an uptick in in juvenile crime, but most likely because there's just going to be more kids. Yeah. Well, you have yourself a very happy holiday. Well, thank you. We'll get a chance to visit in December or not. All right. If you have time, we'd love to have you back. Well, I'm always glad to come over and talk to you, Gordian. Maybe talk a bit about, uh, you know, I don't know if you have any new initiatives in your office in the new coming year, things well, that you're looking at doing. We can certainly talk about what's, what's going on and what we're doing looking forward. I appreciate it. Thanks, John. All right. Thanks, Gordy. John Fossum is the Rice County attorney with us this morning. As I mentioned before, we're trying to get somebody in to talk about the tree lighting ceremony coming up on Monday, which we will be broadcasting live. And obviously, I'd like to talk to him before I, before I go up there and broadcast live so I know what's going on. I can't imagine there being a lot of changes. But we're trying to get somebody in here the next couple of days. That tree lighting is 7 o'clock Monday night, by the way, up in District 1 Hospital. And we will be broadcasting it, as I mentioned, here on KDHL. Next Tuesday, we'll be talking with Northfield Chamber folks about their winter walk, which is a week from tomorrow. A week from tomorrow is the winter walk in Northfield, and so we're looking forward to visiting with them about that. That's coming up next Tuesday, and again, we're still in the process of trying to get something done here for tomorrow and Friday. So, thanks to John Fawson for stopping in today. By the way, I think I reminded you of this earlier, but we have Carlton men's basketball tonight. At Our Winona. Game. Yeah. That yeah. should be a good game. Yes, it will be a good game. St. Mary's University and the Carlton Knights. It's the MIC Conference opener for both teams. This is a men's game. We'll have a women's game on Saturday when Carlton heads to the College of St. Benedict in St. Joseph. So, yes, I get to go to Winona tonight, St. Joseph. You're in Judy KDHLM, Minnesota.